welcome to shrink wrap i'm ken vertness and i'm guest hosting for steve katz who's away on vacation and having a great time and we're going to have a great time too today i've got a very dear friend who's a former resident of hawaii and now lives in minnesota so she's come a long long way to be on shrink wrap with me so i'm happy to introduce debbie jones debbie welcome and thanks for coming all this way and i know you just didn't do it for shrink wrap but we'll talk about that later right. debbie and i are going to do some time traveling today and uh, debbie's going to take us back 42 years to when uh, we were both fanatics for science fiction and fantasy and debbie founded this book club which is still going after 42 years and tell us a little bit about that debbie well thank you ken it's a delight to be here and uh thinking back to all that time ago in the mid 70s uh, it was a very different world and uh, it wasn't nearly as easy to find people who were interested in the things that uh, i was interested in i was uh, really a crazy Lord of the Rings fan at the time and it was still a little new but we didn't have Facebook and we didn't have the internet and and so you had to kind of find people by accident and I was hoping to find people that were interested in starting a book discussion group uh, that would meet on a regular basis and it took a little while I think I finally shanghai a bunch of uh, friends that we knew through the University of Minnesota into meeting at our place um, to talk about the Lord of the Rings. I probably promised them cookies, <laughs> big <laughs> cookies. And uh, the group, we kept going. We met about once a month. Uh, we actually moved over to, I think it's the YMCA across the street from campus. Uh, one of our very early members, Steve, was uh, running a, a, a weekly, I think it was weekly, coffee house where mm -hmm. people played guitars and mm -hmm. sang. And that would allow him to kind of do both. So it was just convenient. And so we met there and at various people's apartments and outside. And we would discuss a different fantasy book, occasionally science fiction, every month. Um, I'm sorry to say there were not as many of them in those days as there are now, and some of them were a little hard to find. Uh, but we talked about uh, uh, The Lord of the Rings and the C.S. Lewis books, the, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and his Space Trilogy. Also uh, Charles Williams, too. Charles Williams, I, I always hope to include. For some reason, <laughs> Charles Williams was never quite as as popular a choice no, as, as, as others. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea trilogy, of course, was that was then a trilogy, uh, came out then. Um, the, uh, the very earliest Dragon Riders of Fern books were coming out at the time. Uh, we also made an attempt to find some of the classics of fantasy that were had been out of print, some of them, for a long time, and we would take turns with the one library copy at uh, either at the University of Hawaii at Manoa or at the public library. Uh, and uh, for instance, the Lord Denzany, King of Elfland's daughter, yes. does that ring King. a bell? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I some was there for that. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it was a small group, mostly students, friends of, of ours, and people who just kind of either heard about us and came and sat in and joined the group, or uh, it was very much word of mouth. We this is a good spot to bring Terry in, because right. my understanding is that a lot of the members at the first, and I, I joined the second year, mm -hmm. uh, so I was not there for the first year. But as I remember, most of the people at the beginning were from the Institute of Astronomy at UH which Terry was a graduate student. Yes, my husband Terry, uh, in fact, the reason that we came here was because he was starting a PhD program in astronomy at the Institute, which was then only like five years old. It was a new institute, it's now celebrating its 50th anniversary, which is why we're here now. But there was a very wonderful group of um, at faculty and graduate students at the time, very energetic and engaged. and. A lot of fun was had by the group of people that were here at the time. 
um, they're all dedicated and enthusiastic about about science, and many of them were also readers, and uh, they were interested, and so people did participate from that group of graduate students. This would have been about between 1974 to 1978, 79, when a lot of that group dispersed, and of course including by that, you. yes, including <laughs> us, we left in 1978. Um, and by that time, you were a regular, and several of the other, a uh, number of the other folks that you knew uh, that had joined us because you spread the word among your friends. Uh, some of them are still, still with the group, and I think that is just one of the most joyful things that's happened in my life is that this little group of student, graduate students in that little apartment in Makiki still meets regularly after all this time. 42 years. 42 years, yes. We have uh, a reunion. Uh, by the way, you can see in the backdrop the Institute of Astronomy uh, that Debbie was talking about where uh, she and Terry will be for the rest of the week celebrating 50 years at the Institute of Astronomy. Mm -hmm. And that's a feat in itself. We celebrated 42. Uh, we celebrated our 40th two years ago on yes. Kauai. And we do it about every 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, our 30th was on um, Maui. On Maui. And mm -hmm. our 20th was on the Big Island. And so, uh, and we get Debbie and Terry to come out for those two. And that's always a wonderful thing. And uh, It's great to have an excuse to come back. We, uh, I'm still homesick for this place. In January. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in January. I wonder, I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> I remember the Midwest. I remember yeah. the Midwest in winter. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, you know, you can find little pieces of the islands almost anywhere over there, and, and we have, but it's always a pleasure to come back. And um, this time is particularly wonderful because for the first time in many years, a lot of us from that era will be gathered together. And it, you know, I, I don't go to the professional astronomy meetings where my husband is likely to run into this one or that one. But uh, this time I was able to come and I'll have a chance to see a lot of people that were certainly great friends back in the day. And uh, that's, and I'm also very proud of them. They have done some amazing science and wonderful science has come out of the Institute here and University of Hawaii and the observing that goes on here, you know, people come from all over the world to observe here. That's a great program and mm -hmm. uh, I was always fascinated with astronomy because I was always fascinated with science fiction. So astronomy was a natural and the mm -hmm. thing I liked about the people from the Institute of Astronomy that I met in your book club was the fact that they were not just scientists. There were some astronomers who were pretty hardcore scientists, mm -hmm. but they were also dreamers. And those are the people who generally came to those meetings. And I think that's a great combination to have a scientific background, but also be able to dream and imagine possibilities. And that's what we're going to talk about today uh, a lot, because I want to not only look back at the book club and the Institute of Astronomy, but I also want to look forward into what's coming up mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the possibilities and the dreams that we have. And I know. Debbie has done a lot of things in her life, been a, done a, uh, explored a lot of different avenues, and she's still looking ahead, and that's what I'm very interested in, and <laughs> seeing, seeing where you're going to go and where your dreams are now, and, uh, and I'd like to talk about that. Okay. Uh, would you like me to work my way forward, or? Uh, I think we've got a few minutes to sort of get into it. Now, you mentioned Ursula Le Guin. Uh, and, you, and you mentioned to me before about McMaster's, who was a very much big influence on you. Uh, Bujold. I always get oh, the name mixed up. Bujold, yeah. Uh, Lois McMaster Bujold, uh, yeah. who is my current favorite author. Uh, I cycled through many, of course, starting with J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and uh, including going back to Dr. Seuss, it's amazing how, uh -huh. how lasting an influence Dr. Seuss has on me because that was fantasy. You know, if you think back to the 500 oh, yeah. hats of Bartholomew sure, Cubbins sure. and I... Uh, what I saw on Mulberry Street. Mulberry Street <laughs> and On Beyond Zebra and all of those things. What they did was they, in a playful way, took you outside of the ordinary. And the 
I guess, the hard edges of reality. And reality seemed a lot more hard edged when I was a kid than it, either it is now or I, I guess there's a lot more acceptance of fantasy. But Dr. Seuss was kind of sneaky and playful about allowing children to, um, to be imaginative. And of course, there were the fairy tales and everything that we all read. But um, Did you read uh, Dr. Seuss to your kids? Oh, yes. Oh, what was course. their favorite? Uh, you know, I think that uh, they preferred the ones that were more recent than the ones we just mentioned. Oh. I'm trying to think of some of the names. There was one that we read to my daughter that, and I'm, I'm not remembering it now, but uh, there was a certain page that had a very dark image that she was so distressed by because it was very terrifying to her. And something was going in, happening in her imagination with that page that was fascinating. We've talked about it since. And she'd say, yes, it was, it was really scary to me. And it was just a page in a Dr. Seuss book. Interesting. So you know, there's, they, they connect with kids' imaginations. And uh, I was always interested in the kinds of things that pulled me out those special doors, those yeah. doors of imagination into things that were not uh, of the ordinary world. Uh, those special doors are what I really want to talk about. We're coming up okay. on a break pretty soon. But uh, those special doors, this is where we sort of interface with psychology, which is my other, of course, big interest. Because I'm always looking to open doors for my clients, to open mm -hmm. doors to possibilities of new ways, of non-scary ways, mm -hmm. of ways to cope with the fearful things that we have in life. Yes. And fantasy did that for us when we were young. Fantasy did. and. Uh, and it would, even then, though, it was really not a very acceptable kind of literature. It wasn't even considered literature. We, we were used to the fact that people write academic papers on these things now. That was not done in the 60s, you know. They yeah. were, maybe Lewis Carroll, maybe yeah. Yeah. if it had been around long enough, but Tolkien, no. And Le Guin, I, and even Ray Bradbury, they're, they're they're classics now. They're studied. They're accepted. But at the time, they were a little underground. Exactly. A little bit. Exactly. And, uh, we're going to come up on a break, so all right. save that thought. Okay. okay. All right. So yeah, we're going to break, and you're going to have a commercial for uh, about two minutes, and then we'll be back to talk about those open doors and those things to make life a little bit more fun and interesting for us. Thank you. All right, welcome back to Shrink Wrap. We're talking with Debbie Jones, and we're just about to open some doors, some fantastic doors, some doors that will show us the future, uh, maybe of science, maybe of astronomy, but also the future of the inner mind, the fantasies that we create ourselves. Uh, and Debbie was talking just before the break about the fact that we've come a long way, and we have. You know, when I look at a whole bunch of things, you know, our we've made so many progresses in gender issues and racial issues, and we have, you know, it's, uh, fantasy and science fiction is much more acceptable, but it's still, I mean, you take a look at the movies today, uh, science fiction and fantasy movies are sort of put off the side. They're not considered real serious stuff, just like animation is still not considered more serious stuff. Mm -hmm. And actually, the fantasies are one of the most serious things we have because in the fantasies, there's hope for us. And so many people today, especially that I see as clients, uh, they've lost that hope. They're sort of mired in this 
stressful present day environment mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it's different in the ways that our parents our environment when we were growing up but it's still uh, an environment that's looking at the practical how can I make more money how can I extend this how can I buy a bigger house and in the end that's not really satisfying when you get to the end mm -hmm. uh, the work I've done with elderly clients uh, they don't regret uh, they don't wish they had a bigger house they tend to wish they had explored more and been with people more and that type of thing and this is where books and fantasies can help us so I wanted to sort of go back to that and and sort of talk about what what dreams that you had that were most helpful to you on your you know on your sort of journey as we've been on the journey for quite a while yes <laughs> Uh, I think one of the most exciting things about this kind of literature uh, to me then and still is uh, the ability, the idea that you can create a different world, your own world, a new world. Um, you can draw maps of it. You can imagine the culture that lives there. You can create characters that do a, that that have a story, a narrative that is not yours, but it is yours because you make it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't have to be you right here, this person, you know, but you can actually be other people uh, through your own creations. Whether you, and for some people this means, well, I can imagine that I'm Frodo. Well, maybe you could, yes, uh, and that's why those books are, are fun, but you can also invent your own world and of course, a lot of people then piggyback that on with a fanfic. You've, you've heard of that fan fiction where people write their own versions of care, their own sure. characters. Um, or you can create your own complete world. And that, that was a very exciting idea to me. Um, I think, uh, d personally, for me, it was uh, as much about what they wore and what how they decorated their houses and what the landscape looked like. I was, I was the art director. I wasn't necessarily the script writer. So uh, that side of but it. But you did is, write a novel. I did write a novel. Yeah, I did. And that was about a dream, right? It was based on a dream mm -hmm. that I had uh, when um, we were here, students, graduate students here in the 1970s. And uh, it, uh, it was a good, very long book, and I recognized very late, and it took me many years to write. I belonged to a writer group in uh, the Twin Cities, and we would meet once a month, and each one of us would read aloud a piece of whatever we were working on. So when I look back at it now, I realize that the rhythm of the sizes of the chapters and the way things happen <laughs> is very much governed by the amount of time that I would have to read aloud to this group monthly. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of built in the, the structure to the structure of the novel. Uh, that's just, th that, and that kept me going. I would have to have something prepared mm -hmm. for the group. So I would do these pieces and sometimes I would have to go back and revise. But I did finish that. Yeah, it's never been published. It was it seemed when I got to the end that finishing it and revising it was uh, enough. <laughs> well, tell us about the dream that, that inspired it. Uh, well, in the dream, I dreamed that uh, uh, the character, and it wasn't even really me in the dream, um, was a, a graduate student mm -hmm. and somewhat frustrated mm -hmm. career-wise. And made sort of ma accidentally made a discovery that one of the reasons that she wasn't successful was that everyone else knew that there were these secret societies that you had to be recruited into one in order to get a thesis topic and mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. And uh, so this character uh, stumbles on this sort of unknown underground secret world that has been, one of the rules is that you have to find out about it for yourself. You can't. Nobody can tell you. Nobody can tell you. You have to discover yeah. it yourself. And uh, she also has, uh, there's an antagonist who's made it her business to make sure that uh, all the efforts to discover have been stymied and that this character's been steered down the wrong road, which is that she's crazy. 
So I'm just imagining it, which is kind of, you know, just imagine that phrase um, has a double-edged meaning. Mm -hmm. And that was what kind of what this book goes, goes to is like, well, it's just imagination. Or on the other hand, just imagine. Um, <laughs> um, now, as a psychologist, I'd look at that and say, well, this is your way of working through, you know, the pros and cons. This is uh, your way of working through those frustrations and looking at both sides and sort of mm -hmm. looking for where to go. Where's the door to this? Well, it was a, it was a wonderful metaphor. And I don't really believe that it was a metaphor for anything that I was necessarily going through at the time in any obvious way. But it was the whole idea that, that uh, society was kind of underpinned by this secret culture that y you could go through your life and not know about and then stumble on and then stumble deeper and stumble deeper and, and that it might be menacing and it might be dangerous. Uh, yeah. And yet you, would, you could gather allies and that's what happens in the book is that the character gradually gathers this very odd group of misfits uh, to go on this journey with her. And um, I left it kind of as a cliffhanger at the end. I always intended Waiting to, for a sequel. to go back and write. <laughs> but at the time, I was kind of finished with it. And I felt it was a complete story. But there's another story to be told about these characters. And perhaps now that I'm looking forward to a time when I hope to have more time to write, I will tell that story. I will find out what it is, because I don't really know <laughs> what it is. Well, that's the exciting thing about writing, is yes. you don't know. You know, you start writing, and you think you know, but it takes a life of its own. The characters take on a life of its own. Well, they do. And, and you just follow along. You, you do, know? and sometimes you get very angry at them. <laughs> This, this, this is not what I planned for you. <laughs> Why are you doing this? But, but they lead you in interesting places. They, they lead you to interesting places. And sometimes the people that they encounter are not who they seem to be when they first turn up. Yeah. And sometimes they're a lot more interesting than you realize. So you've written out a bit more. And uh, it's not a, a straight road. There's a lot of detours and you know, going back and like doing it over. Like life, yeah. Yeah, so uh, th that particular seed, that dream, it's not as important to me now, and whatever it meant is kind of lost in the history of what I, I did with it, taking to write that But that the nice story. thing is that dreams continue, and that you have different dreams in different decades or different years, and that dreams change, they and do. your path changes, and the way you look at the world changes. Uh, that's really true. I thought that I would be a writer, and I took major detours from that, and uh, usually doing other kinds of creative work, as I, as you know, I've done a lot of visual art mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to writing. But these things go in cycles, and uh, dreams have always been an important resource for me. Um, and I get the feeling you're ready for a new cycle. I think so, yes. And what would that new cycle, might it look like? I think uh, it looks like uh, I would really like to cycle back more to the writing and the narrative than I, than I have been doing for the last 35, 40 years. Uh, I've done a lot of visual art in that time. And uh, a little offbeat, I, I made costumes, as you know. Uh, Costume con. You went to a number of costume yeah, cons. Yeah, yeah. Which most people probably don't know anything about. It's, it's they a, know about, uh, you know, comic book. Yeah. Comic con, it, but not costume con. This predated uh, cosplay by many decades and grew out of science fiction conventions back in the late 50s. But there are people who liked dressing up. And it was a sort of a place where you could go and, you know, be a wizard or a gypsy or whatever. And beautiful art was made by the people who were in that. And I got to the point, though, where it was physically a little more challenging than I was really enjoying anymore. So I turned more to electronic and digital media. Uh, Did you wear the costumes yourself? Oh, yes. I made them just for myself. We, we had competitions that we, we were in, and sometimes solitary alone. I, I, um, I did a lot of collaborative work. I love collaborative art. 
uh, with Eleanor Farrell, who was as close to being the other founder of the, the Salmoth Nower group as, as you could be. Uh, we did a lot of projects together. Now, now, when you put those costumes on, you know, and I, I work with this in psychology a lot, mm -hmm. try to get a person to try on a new persona. And one of the things that helps is have them change the way they dress. That's very true. So what was it like? Uh, how did you feel different in different costumes? I, it was, again, it was like opening one of those doors into an alternate reality. Uh, the, the trap that I fell into was getting so involved with the actual creating and the making that wearing it was kind of almost an afterthought. <laughs> you didn't take time to enjoy your own creation. I didn't take enough time oh. to enjoy them. But I still have most of them. And of course, a lot of it's preserved on videotape. Or uh, nobody uses videotape anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. It's preserved digitally. I, was, I, I won um, a bunch of awards, including at the World Science Fiction Convention a couple of times. I saw pictures of those. And these were fabulous, fabulous costumes. Uh, we're sort of running out of time. But I mm -hmm. like, the, like where we're going as far as the alternate stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. so many people today are so unhappy and dissatisfied, and to be able to look at an alternate s situation, an mm -hmm. alternate life, an mm -hmm. alternate being, uh, is oftentimes just really incredibly therapeutic. It certainly can be, uh, if it's done in a healthy way. Uh, it's always been a, I hesitate to use the word escape for me. But it's also, you know, doors can lead into a small room. They can also lead out into a grand ballroom a, or uh, a wonderful landscape. Yes, absolutely. A wonderful landscape that's open and free. And they can be very freeing. In fact, um, Tolkien himself wrote a very famous essay called On Fairy Stories, where he, he talked about people dismissing this kind of literature as escapism and fairy tales, escapism, escapism. And he said, well, talk, think about how, what escape is like if you're a prisoner. Yeah, incredibly freeing. Yes. And uh, opening up to everything. There's running out on your responsibilities, that kind of escapism. And there is freeing yourself from the prison of whatever is holding you in and holding you back. That's terrific. Uh, We've sort of run out of time. So mm -hmm. I wish we could go on for a long time because it is just so nice being with you, Debbie Jones. And... Uh, and it's just great seeing you again. And it's great going back and going forward to possibilities that, uh, well, not only the literature can give us, but also the writing and mm -hmm. any other thing that we do to sort of move out and sort of expand our universe. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for uh, joining us at Shrink Wrap. Uh, I'm Ken Burton, sitting again in for Stephen Katz. And it's been a pleasure as always. And I hope to see you again sometime in the future. <laughs>